how watermelon tourmaline forms. It's probably responsible to mention, because no doubt it will be mentioned in the comment section if I don't say this, that what actually constitutes a watermelon tourmaline can be quite, let's say, contentious. For example, in front of you, you have a beautiful watermelon tourmaline characterised by pink at the bottom and green at the top. Most people would consider this to be a watermelon tourmaline. But there is a series of purists who insist that a watermelon tourmaline, to be considered a watermelon tourmaline, needs to be characterised by pink in the middle and green around the exterior. Like this. I, however, am going to navigate around this argument by just explaining how both of them form. Got it? Mineral rich water. Crystallisation. Layering the first colour. The second colour. And final shape and discovery. I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail about how tourmaline actually forms, because for context I've already got a video teaching you exactly that. However, just to save you darting around between videos, I will gloss over how tourmaline forms, and it starts with hot mineral rich water, which is essentially very deep underground. Now this hot mineral rich water is rich in minerals like lithium and manganese, iron and aluminium, and it flows through cracks in the rocks. So these minerals are essentially the building blocks for tourmaline crystals, bear that in mind. Now, as this mineral rich element laden water begins to cool down, it's going to start to crystallise and form tourmaline crystals. And yes, this process is very much similar to how a lot of different crystals form. Heat from geothermal activity drives water, ridden with elements, closer to the surface, and as these begin to cool down, they'll form various different kinds of crystals. They'll form different kinds of crystals based on the recipe, so the different kind of elements in that water. They fit together at the atomic level in slightly different ways, a bit like Lego bricks. And as these form into different shapes, those different shapes contingent on particular compositions make up different crystals. Tourmaline crystals merely form as a result of silicon, oxygen, boron forming together in a very unique way and then being coloured by various different trace elements. OK, we're going to start to segue into different distinctions of watermelon tourmaline here, so pay attention. Now, bicoloured, which to remind you is one colour at the top and another colour at the bottom, initially the crystal grows in a very specific direction and the mineral composition at that stage determines the first colour layer. For example, if there's more manganese in the original mix, it stands to reason that the base of that crystal might form as a pink or red However, in contrast with a concentric tourmaline, which is pink in the middle and green on the outside, for those of you that can't commit that to memory, similarly, in the concentric variety, the core of the crystal forms first, with the higher concentration of manganese resulting in pink in the middle. Now, in regards to the bicoloured tourmaline, as the crystallisation continues, the mineral composition changes possibly with an increase in something like iron, or perhaps other trace elements. This creates a different colour at the other end of that crystal. Now this can be lots of different colours, it can be green or blue or yellow, but with a watermelon tourmaline, there's generally going to be a distinction between pink and green, or some variation of that. Now this leads to a bicoloured appearance, with one colour at the top and another colour at the bottom. Now, with the concentric variety, the crystallisation progresses and the surrounding mineral composition changes. So this introduces again elements like iron or various different other trace elements, because this is not an exact science. And this forms an outer layer around the pink core, typically green, creating the characteristic watermelon appearance with green on the outside and pink on the inside. Now this is where the distinction between bicoloured and concentric starts to fade away, because over time various different geological processes are going to contribute to the overall shape. There's lots of variables involved here. How much space did it have? How much access to the mineral solution did it have? Heat, pressure, time, there's a lot of variables that act upon the ultimate shape of that tourmaline crystal. But over time, various different geological processes, such as erosion or uplift, are going to bring these beautiful crystals closer to the surface, where we can then, I don't know, exploit them. 
Let me know in the comments what watermelon tourmaline camp you fall into. Does it even matter?